before I get started, I, I need to give like an unbelievable thank you to the people who've organized this. Um, uh, Human Condition, uh, Fiat Physica, all the sponsors, uh, but especially to Mike Caprio, who, if you guys know him, works like an honest-to-God superhero to pull this stuff off year after year. Um, I don't know why I was asked to be the keynote speaker. Uh, I, I imagine that they wanted somebody who can speak eloquently about the importance of space hacking, uh, and then that person was hit by a bus, so they called me. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so I, I, I was challenged to think of a really compelling reason or a really compelling thing to say to everybody. Um, and I decided uh, in, in something that's my way to, to tell a story um, about who I am. And, and so I'm going to tell a bit of a story and I'm going to start with my childhood. Um, and this story kind of uh, begins behind a row of really neat homes at the top of a hill belonging to the professors and administrators of Kenyatta University in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, behind those homes is a small, unintimidating fence. If you stand against it and look forward, you stare across a few hundred yards of poorly managed savanna grass and a silted drainage dish. Uh, and one more fence, a bigger fence. It's obvious that the person who built this fence meant to keep people out. These two fences are completely dissimilar except for one small thing, a jagged, poorly shared hole torn at the bottom just where the fences meet the dirt. A hole just large enough for two curious four-year-old boys with tiny hands and big eyes to squeeze through, like, just. My friend, Daniel, and I met at our little portal. Every morning we could escape the house unnoticed. It was a very different time in suburban East Africa when the bodies of two four-year-old boys belonged to statistics, and it was clear that it took a village because no one really wanted to be responsible when fewer little heads came home than left that morning. Um, Daniel and I would contort ourselves through the fence, sprint across the prairie, dive down and then up the banks of that silted ditch and through a hole in the last fence through our airlock. Beyond it were these huge metallic stalactites, forgotten old cars and tin roofs, orphaned from whatever thing they protected in a former life. Mountains that ranged in the nearest of the salvage yards that dotted the borders separating the Nairobi metropolis from the equatorial plains that seemed to stretch out to infinity. It's really important that I paint this picture to you because it helps explain an object that I'm about to describe. In the life of every East African boy that grew up in the 80s was a toy. There really was, weren't any department stores where you could go and buy a toy. So if a young boy had a toy in East Africa in the 80s, it was something that he'd made. And the toy of choice, or at least of desire, for most young boys was something called a galimoto. You see, a galimoto was a type of handmade kinetic sculpture that young children learned to make in Kenya. They're made mostly of sculpted heavy gauge wire, bits of torn cloth, discarded sugarcane stalks, and various bits of old broken things that you find in the trash thrown away that evening. To make a galimoto, you rummage through the shed, snip bits of wire off your chicken coop, turn over your neighbor's trash, and spend the evening twisting bits of, metals and, bits of metal and cloth and plastic until you form a little car or a bicycle or an airplane. You push that along the ground and marvel as the tiny joints and axles and levers come to life. At least that's what the amateurs did. If you were a professional, you didn't settle for the picked over fodder laying around the neighborhood. You sourced your, your sourced quality material. Daniel and I were professionals. So in the evening, we'd mount our little pil pilgrimage to the salvage yard, tear the doors off old Toyotas, unwind the primary coils of microwave transformers, rip only the finest fabrics from the rear back seats of Volvo 740 sport wagons, and just lose ourselves. Up until recently, the grand architecture of that childhood was the most visceral experience of my life. I wouldn't trade that childhood for every dollar on earth if it meant the possibility of not being born into that world of creation. But that's the thing, isn't it? What four-year-old child has an implicit grasp of the power of creative expression? None. Children are a ball of potential energy filling their orbits of curiosity like dense free ions, unsatiated and hungry for electrons. Children, given a long enough leash, are born unbounded by fear, cynicism, fatigue and insecurity. They rush into this world fighting entropy as though they expect to actually win. I'm recently a father of two now and there is no greater sight than watching the whole cosmos flood in through the tiny little hands of children.
We grow up, don't we? And the bliss of ignorance gives way to the fear of failure. The blind confidence in the next looming adventure congeals into weights bound around our cynical spirits. We grow tired, and every day we wake up and look in the mirror and notice flaws. We grow defeated. With our tired bodies, burned minds, we witness the news dejected until those free orbits from our childhood are filled from the fire hose of discontent. What happened? Bizarre, isn't it? Bizarre especially because statistically, we're living through the most peaceful, fastest growing, prosperous time in the entire arc of human history. Fewer people die of infectious disease than ever. More of the world's population belongs to the middle class than in any time in human history, and advances in transportation and information technology are threatening a spectacular age of exploration that's beginning to peer over the horizon. So what reconciles this feeling we have, this heaviness, with the reality of an imperfect world getting better every day? Well, let me finish the story I began. My family immigrated to the United States in the late 80s. My father was accepted into a doctoral program at the University of Minnesota, and rather than spend money on childcare, he would take me to class, or more often than not, just leave me in the university library, presumably to be picked up at some point. I discovered, in that library, I discovered Isaac Asimov and Carl Sagan, and for the first time in my life, I heard somebody describe the world in a language of universal hope. It's not that Sagan didn't warn us about being poor stewards of our home planet. It's not that Asimov didn't paint vistas in which we fell victim to our technological hubris. It's that at the center of their message was an evangelism of creativity, a call to arms for hungry, hungry young things lost in rows of books trying to find a description for this burning thing in their chest that makes them so badly want to just make. I learned for the first time what it meant to be an engineer a builder of things. They taught me to be mindful of all the things that I cannot change and then change the way I think. So how do we account for the gap between the world we feel and the world that really is? We do it by noting that the feeling I got in the halls of the university library is the feeling that dragged young men and women away from their homes, around the country, to the California desert to erect the Saturn V rocket and send man to a place that we have yet to come down from. The world gets better because the world's makers of uh, Peace, the world's makers of music, and the world's makers of things show up. Three years ago, at my first Space Apps Challenge, I showed up. Something amazing happened. I walked in a web developer who thought his dream of building rockets had faded with the self-confidence of my adolescence. I left the building holding a tiny piece of something that would unimaginably lead me shortly thereafter to co-found an honest-to-God aerospace company my free orbits began accepting energy again, bringing me closer to the whole atom that I, that, I haven't been, that I hadn't been since my childhood. My little impossible band of nerds buried ourselves in rocket manuals and physics papers and vacuum chambers. We converted a friend's Brooklyn living room into a high-voltage electronics lab. At least once, we were stopped by Canadian Border Patrol on our way back from a demonstration of some volumetric mapping technology that we'd built and interrogated about whether or not we'd stolen the admittedly suspicious contents of our minivan from a nearby military research installation <laughs> that was apparently working on something similar that they'd recently lost. Um, my company eventually failed. A victim of the million little things that green entrepreneurs do to sabotage their success and the million little things that the world tends to add as an excise task on doing something hard. But not without completing a prototype vacuum arc thruster that was capable of propelling a small spacecraft by eating away at the frame of the satellite itself, ionizing the material and hurling it into the void in a stream of plasma. It's hard to feel bad about successfully constructing an ion propulsion engine funded by credit cards and borrowed sleep. Besides, what's more important is that I showed up, just like you all here, as hackers and scientists and engineers and investors, organizers and observers you have chosen against your greater cynic to show up. Most recently, I founded a new project to probe the bounds of intelligent machines by embedding neural networks directly into silicon. When you study AI, you necessarily learn a little bit about the fundamental nature of the human brain. One such thing is that all of who we are is encoded in a flow of patterns embedded in a matrix of switches that by themselves are entirely unremarkable. But then one switch fires, and then 10, and then 100 up and down hierarchies until a region resolves into some pattern. 
a pattern that means nothing until it turns to its neighbor and asks it to join forces, and the calculus of creativity resolves a thought, an expression. I cannot describe how much this event has meant to my life and to my faith in the bold things and to my faith that it's restored in bold things. Every single one of you has showed up. Over the course of this weekend, you'll turn to your neighbors and form an unimaginable expression. I promise. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions about, uh, or is, is any, well, here's a good question, sorry. Is, is anybody new to space apps? Is this anybody's first time here? Oh, this is, this is awesome. It's like most of you are new. Um, most of you that are showing up, are you showing up to hack or did you want to observe or is this, uh, is this just kind of like that thing where nerds form this gravity well we all kind of sink into when we're around each other in the same city? Um, how many of you showed up to actually hack? Cool, you're hacking, you're working already, I see it. This guy, he's ahead of the game. Awesome, great, great stuff. Um, I know you guys must have some things you're wondering about this event, and I've, uh, I attended my first one in 2013, um, and a second one in 2014. I didn't attend last year, but I've gotten a bit of a feel for how this works. Surely one or two of you might have a question. Um, you guys have any, yes? What excites you most about space? Oh my God. Uh, what excites me most about space, we are living through the time I used to read about in Ad Astra magazines when I was in elementary school. Um, I, remember, I remember watching the DCX. The DCX was an experimental NASA rocket that took off and landed vertically. Um, I think I was in high school when I saw that, and I was shocked because it looked like a Buck Rogers cartoon, right? Watching a rocket land. When we get to that place, it will be our promised land as a technological society. And I didn't think I would live to see the place, to see a time in which we would regularly transport and return spacecraft from orbit. And this is now something we can expect to see on what might become a monthly basis from now on. Uh, that excites me. It excites me that if you pay attention and you're not cynical, you notice that we are living in the future. Um, and it actually feels that way. So I think that's what excites me the most about space right now. Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. Can you tell a little bit more about the project and where you see it going? Oh, yeah. Um, I was trying to avoid turning this into a pitch, but here it goes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so I, with the original project that came out of Space Apps, um, we created this satellite. Uh, and the idea with this satellite is uh, if you could build something small and build a, a little engine, a little piece of propellant for it, um, uh, that, that, uh, uh, then you could condense the amount of science that you could do in space into a small package. We discovered that it was a really great relay for uh, small communications and then decided that if we're going to build something to relay communications across the globe, um, doing, building a chip on which you could do data science directly on the device could potentially have a dramatic effect uh, on the way people understand machines. And so that was, that's kind of the idea, is, is uh, the computer chip is fundamentally flawed to run artificial intelligence algorithms. It's a serial device. So if you could build a device that works at the silicon level the way the human neocortex does, um, in hyper-parallel, essentially, uh, the efficiency gains could let you do orders of magnitude more computing, more intelligent computing uh, than is currently possible. So, yeah. Um, I've, been, I've been given one of these things, which is like I've killed enough time. So uh, if any of you have any questions, uh, I'm definitely around and I'd, I'd love to talk to you more. Uh, so again, thank you guys so much. Yeah.